put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Recall 2012 movie review. Douglas Quaid has been having some violent dreams for a while, and he wonders what it means. He isn't completely happy with his life building robots. Yeah, I don't know what the guy's deal is. And he's married to Kate Beckinsale. Anyway, so he goes to Recall, an agency that gives you fake memories, that makes you think that you've done something that you couldn't actually afford, but that you really want to do. And when he goes there, something goes wrong, and soon he finds himself hunted by those who want to kill him. Yeah, this is sounding a lot like the old movie so far. And suddenly he's faced with the choice of jumping into a cab with Jessica Biel, who does the whole come with me if you want to live thing, and he hesitates briefly because, you know, a couple of titles flash through his head, titles like Stealth, Blade Trinity, but then he realizes, hey, I was an Alexander, and he hops in, and we have our unnecessary remake. This is ab about as loose an adaptation of the original Philip K. Dick short story, we can remember it for you wholesale, as the 1990 was, in spite of what I believe has been said in interviews, that it was going to be a closer adaptation. I suppose it might be beneficial to just start with a sort of overview. Basically, yeah, this remake didn't really need to exist. About, you know, it takes the original and pretty much just tries to do the same thing. You know, if, if Lynn Wiseman was a Xerox machine, I, I'd say he was a really good one. There are a number of changes, and they're about... Yeah, pretty much equally split on the positives and the negatives, you know. I suppose I could t talk about... There are a few genuinely good things about this. The production design is quite nice. There is this cool mix of Eastern and Western culture basically the world that this is set in, which is, to be honest, not the exact same as the 1991, is basically pretty much all of Earth is unlivable because of chemical warfare. And there are these two places where, you know, there, there's the United Federation of Britain, something like that, and then there's the colony, which is where people actually live. It's, it's basically like the slums. And, yeah, the, you know, the colony is this nice, vivid mix of these different cultural inspirations, you know, and it feels quite real, you know, excuse me, it, it looks like a sort of, I don't know, when you go to a country and they have this one specific section 
of a big city or something devoted to this is where we want tourists to go, you know, it's, it's kind of flashy and very, yeah, I, I don't know quite how to explain it, but just, yeah, these, these different cultures on display and it feels like somewhere that a lot of different people from very different places are trying to call home. You know, they're trying to make it their own, and it's this mishmash. And that's, that's kind of cool. And it definitely does look very... very real, fairly gritty, you know. You, you feel like, you know, you don't really want to live there. You know, you can see how people could live there, but you don't want to live there yourself. And then you have a few cool concepts, such as the it's, it's called The Fall. It's basically this elevator kind of thing. It's the only legal transport between the United British Federation thing, UBF, and the colony. And the cool thing is, you know, basically, you have the planet. This is where UBF is, this is where the colony is. It would take forever to go across the planet and, you know, toxic environment and everything, so they go through, which, yeah, that's pretty cool, you know, and at the halfway point, they switch the gravity, so, you know, before you were sitting normally, and suddenly, you know, you're hanging upside down, that's kind of cool, and then it has some political overtones, with basically, the fall is this symbol of the man keeping us down, you know, because they are control. actually I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's that they're controlling the travel back and forth between UBF and the colony, and there are some very distinct things, you know, it, I'm not sure it's the most subtle of sort of political, you know, movies, but I'd say it makes its point fairly, fairly well, and I didn't personally feel like it was terribly preachy. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's at least not the worst out there as far as that goes. And yeah, you know, it has this. You know, if you're from the colony, you're less likely to to get a promotion, stuff like that. The casting of Colin Farrell is a quite good choice. He is an everyman, which is very true to the original short story. You know, when you watch the 1991, it's Arnie. We can't completely relate to Arnie. It's Arnie. We're just, we're there to watch Arnie do his thing. We're not there to feel like we could be him. We, we might want to be him, but we know we're not him. You know, we look in the mirror, muscles aren't quite there, you know? So, yeah, Colin Farrell, okay, he has a pretty nice amount of muscle as well, but he does feel like, you know, we can more relate to him. Also, I would definitely say the marriage between him and Laurie feels more real. I like the relationship between Arnie and, and Stone in the original, but compared to this one, the Arnie Stone one is a bit, I don't know, maybe glossy, it's, it's a little too perfect, where this feels a little more like a real marriage, you know, they are, I mean, there's clearly a connection, they clearly love each other, but you still feel like these people actually exist, and this kind of relationship actually exists. So, you know, from early on in the film, you're actually somewhat drawn into it. Now, basically, to characterize, this as an action film, you know, where the original was very much an Arnie film, but, you know, with a brain, this is the current brand of big, over-the-top action movie with, you know, video game action sequences. <sighs> Frankly, too much goes on, it happens too fast, and, yeah, it just... I'm trying desperately to distinguish between the different action scenes, and even as I was watching them, I was trying 
really hard to keep up with what was going on, and it's just barely possible. You know, it just it's it's of the school of thought that action shouldn't should just overpower you. You know, you don't you can't completely you know follow the from A to B to C of everything that happens in the action scenes. And it's very much from the Michael Bay school action, you know, big explosions and yeah, just these huge sequences. So yeah, if that's what you want, yeah, the movie delivers that pretty well. I will say that it does a better job of pacing than many current action movies. It is not there's a lot of action, and as I just said, the action is overpowering, but there isn't constant action, and you actually do get into some of the scenes that don't have action. Now, as I said before, this really does just follow the... It, it takes the 1990 movie and uses that as a blueprint. A couple of things are rearranged, played around with, two characters are combined, that's about it. I, I'm almost rendered speechless by just how much they crammed in here. It's almost like they figure, well, everybody loves the Arnie version, so everyone's going to be bringing, like, you know, a bingo plate and just, you know, which actually suggests you do that or make a drinking game out of it and just, you know, ah! That was in the original movie, you know, it's just, yeah, it's pretty much all right there. And I really wish that they had, you know, brought some guts and just said, you know what, we're going to make our own movie here in, instead. That actually really goes to, it's a very bland movie. It's every sci-fi action movie nowadays, really, you know. It fits in all the clichés that were in the original, pretty much, and adds a few that have come since, without the biting satire, the, the half-parody of the genre, you know, the, the tongue-in-cheekness of, do you really think this is happening, this is just what happens in the action movies kind of thing, you know, all that cleverness just gone. Excuse me, and we're left with something terribly two-dimensional. You know, the only thing where this really goes beyond that is, you know, the the to an extent the political overtones, and then as I said, some of these relationships are, you know, feel like you know there's meat to them, but this lacks the. unrelenting energy of Verhoeven, not to mention his, you know, boundless, over-the-top imagination, and both are sorely missed. I said that some of the scenes that don't have action in them you get into, that's not true of all of them. And in fact, some of the action scenes get kind of tiring, because it's at 110%. It starts at 110%, and it never goes down. Sorry, I guess it's, what are, the, what are those called, weebles? Yeah. Wow, that was a Mr. Floppy joke. I am old. Anyway, yeah, the... It just, it, it overpowers you and you're not really, a, a lot of the time you're barely even enjoying it, you know, and... Then we get into all the just obvious, you know, con concepts that are obviously grabbed from other movies. You know, the this time I already said, you know, he Quaid works building robots. They're basically, you know, they have the appearance of the iRobot robots, and they have the sort of intensity of the Terminator. Pretty much, although they are horrible shots compared to Terminator. That's actually another thing. 
This is something that should never happen in an action movie. Several times I seriously felt like characters and or robots were waiting to shoot just to make sure that the action scene could come out in favor of the hero. You know, it just, they seem to not be firing, and, and sometimes it really seems like, you know, there, there's sequences where a character's basically running past a bunch of people shooting at him, and, you know, it, I know that that happens in a bunch of action movies, but this is a really bad example of it, and in general, just, it makes you feel like, well, okay, so he's never going to get hit. Why am I even watching this? You know, is, is there supposed to be tension to this? You know, the, the, bad guy, the, the bad guys can't aim. So, yeah. The effects are obviously quite good. In spite of the action being, you know, overpowering, it's, it's really, it's the pace of it, and to an extent, yes, and, and how long it goes on for. Those are really the, the problems of it. It's not the filming, and it's, maybe to an extent it's the editing, but for what it's worth, the action is shot well, and the editing isn't the biggest problem, at least, in making it you know, confusing and overpowering, so, you know, there's that. Len Wiseman is, thankfully, about as happy to show off his wife, if they are still married, I'm not sure if they're still married, Kate Beckinsale as Paul W. Sanderson is to show off Mila Jovovich, so we have a number of butt shots of both her and Jessica Biel. And that actually seems like that's kind of in place of the the ass kickery that I really feel like there should be. It, the for how substantial the strong female characters were in the nineteen ninety version, in this one it feels like it's constantly Quaid, you know, saving the girl instead of you know again just taking no chances, you know. If you ask a substantial group of guys, a lot of them are going to agree, we like to see women kick ass. You know, it's, it's not that emasculating to us. We can deal with it. You know, it, it, yeah. Other than the relationship between Lori and Quaid, there, there are a few other moments sort of you know, character moments and relationshipy moments that feel kind of genuine and you know those are really the sort of the light at the end of the tunnel of the movie you know there, there's just a little bit to latch on to and to actually you know that that feels real and I suppose that brings me nicely into the overall theme which you know again remains what is real and, you know, would you be able to tell if what you, you know, if, if something that you thought was real actually wasn't real, you know, could, and, yeah, it, it, it gets a little bit more philosophical than the first one in that regard, in place of sort of I don't know, the, the ambiguity is still there, but it just doesn't feel like it's played up as much. It, it almost feels like it's there because it was there in the, in the original. It doesn't feel like it's there because they get it. And it's not that, you know, I like Len Wiseman, I like Kurt Wimmer as well as the other, was it Dan O'Bannon, Ron Schuster? These are the guys who wrote Alien. You know, obviously, they know what they're doing, you know, or at least they used to, I don't know. But, yeah, it... The way it plays in the film, it doesn't feel like they actually get it. It feels like they're just putting it in because, you know, it's more to check off the list of stuff that was in the original. 
but yeah, it gets a little more philosophical. There's like one or two philosophical lines in the 1990 version, and frankly, they feel a little out of place because they're, they're it's the only in the movie, and in this, it's a little bit more of a thing. You know, there are a couple of characters who will say things that are really clearly philosophical and really go into, well, not, not deeply, but it, it goes into the, you know, is reality real theme about as much as the original. It's just dealt with in these lines of dialogue instead of in sort of the overall approach, you know. It doesn't feel as much like, it doesn't inspire paranoia to the same extent, it doesn't make you question what is real and what isn't. There is one scene which isn't bad, though, in that, that kind of place for that. But yeah, other than these philosophical lines, the dialogue is pretty mediocre. The humor, I wouldn't say it's not there, I'd say it doesn't work. There are a couple of lines that are actually really close to being funny, and then they botch it in one way or another. There is not a laugh to be had in this movie, which is really quite sad. It, it really, there really should be, you know. You can tell that it's a Kurt Wimmer movie, or at least one written by him, and it doesn't feel as awkward as it did with Salt. You know, that was very clearly not a movie that if Wimmer had directed it, and if he had gotten to just do, you know, yeah, Wimmer does this kind of thing, and Equilibrium, and this stuff where he gets to just kind of go nuts with sci-fi action, that he does fairly well, but a straight-up action thriller kind of thing without sci-fi, that is just not his thing, you know. That actually does bring me into what this is that the first one wasn't particularly is more of a spy movie. There were points, frankly, it reminded me of One Identity. And again, that's a bit, you know, the, the movie is basically the 1990 movie updated to today and then a bunch of movies that have gotten popular since then. You know, we have a scene very reminiscent of that you know, Chase, what was it, like a vertical street, I think, in Minority Report. It's been a while since I watched that movie. But yeah, you know, this street and this car chase and that. This movie has a scene very much like that, you know. But, but yeah, you know, it plays up the spy angle more. And, you know, that's again where Colin Farrell comes in. You know, it, it's a good casting choice because... You buy him as the Everman, and you buy him as a spy. I mean, if they had tried to make Arnie very spy, I mean, they don't particularly play off that angle in the original. And it wouldn't have worked if they had, because you don't believe that Arnie can infiltrate somewhere. You know, it, Arnie doesn't infiltrate, he just blows crap up. You know, I love the guy, but he's not, yeah, you know, he's, he's a physical presence, you know, and Obviously, also with, you know, without Arnie, without the big uh, hulking brute, we, you know, we have room for more choreographed fight scenes. And, yeah, you know, if you like martial arts, they're, they're decent, you know. It's, the same problems apply to that, as I already mentioned earlier, you know, that goes for the action scenes in general. But yeah, other than these nicely choreographed martial arts fight scenes, we have, you know, shootouts, car chases, yeah, you know. Brian Cranston is a decent enough villain. Now, at first I was like, really? The dad from Malcolm in the Middle? But he does pretty decently. The characterization is a lot weaker in this than in the 1991. And it does, it is over CGI'd, you know, where the original felt very, 
you know, there, there are a lot of effects, but a lot of them are practical and sort of makeup effects, and it feels real, it feels like you could reach out and touch it, in this it feels very superficial, you know, too much CGI and yeah, too little time spent building up things and making us care about things, kind of. And the ending is much less satisfying than the 1990 version. I believe that pretty well covers it. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.